<laughs> Welcome. You can tell something exciting is happening up front today, can't you? This past several Sundays, we have been thinking about what it means to be exiles, journeying through an uncomfortable, unfamiliar landscape, strange, where we don't know where we are going. A few years ago, my oldest daughter and I drove from Phoenix, drove a car from Phoenix to Rochester, New York. We were helping another daughter move. And during that trip, we laughed in the car together, told stories, gasped in fear at the weather conditions in the Midwest. Literally, one time we couldn't, it was raining so hard, we couldn't see the edges of the road. And we were on an interstate freeway. Everybody was zipping past us at I don't know how fast. It was, it was really frightening. But um, during this trip, we got lost multiple times got back on track, and we decided that our motto was, if we get lost, we can get found again. Because this is before smartphones and Google Earth, and so we were just using the old-fashioned maps, you know, the kind you have to fold, and you say, oh, it's not on that side, it's on this side, and you flip it, and it's upside down, and you don't know which direction you're looking at. I see some of you nodding your heads. So we had to rely on maps that you had to fold and unfold, and um, on face-to-face -face voice instructions. So, you know, things were a little uncertain for us. Well, all bets were off towards the end of our journey. We got to Rochester, New York, unloaded all their stuff into their apartment, and then we were headed off for the last leg of our adventure for the summer, which was driving to JFK Airport <laughs> in New York City. And all I ever knew about New York City was what I'd seen on television or read in books, and it was frightening. I was really scared. And my uncle, I had two uncles who were commercial airline pilots, and I called Uncle Dale and I said, uh, what's the best way to get to JFK Airport? And he said, take a train. <laughs> he said, I have been there, and there are monsters. And I went, oh, we, we can't do it. We actually did try to, to book a train. We couldn't do it. It wasn't possible. So um, there we were having to do something that we didn't know how to do, and we were so scared, and there really were monsters. We made it to the airport, obviously, and here I am, we made it back home. But have you ever felt like that? That you're looking for monsters around the corner? I feel like 2020 has kind of been a year like that, don't you? Um, so in this landscape, this calendar year, this election, all of the tornadoes, the hurricanes, the murder hornets, the poisonous caterpillars, I mean, this is crazy. We have monsters around, around every corner, and we just are afraid to even open another door sometimes. But here we are. In this book we've been reading, First Peter, there's one word that he mentions over and over again, and that is the word hope. And so we are a people of hope, aren't we? These past few weeks, we have been listening to the Apostle Peter, a loving father, a pastor who cares about his congregation, but his congregation is living in exile. And I remind you to look at the first verse, first two verses of chapter one, and you read, to all God's family scattered. And then he lists the names of the, the country where all the believers have been shunted off to because they have been driven out of their homes. They are truly exiles. I mean, even more than we have felt like this in this crazy year. So he cares about his congregation. They've been scattered throughout the known world. And this loving pastor uses words like past, from the past. The co-called, the elect, the chosen, the redeemed, a chosen race, a royal priesthood. And then he uses words that refer to the future. He talks about inheritance, a glory to be revealed, exaltation. But Peter's focus is not on these people's past or on their future. The whole message is about the now. How to live now. 
how to represent a kingdom, how to be citizens of a country that doesn't look like any other country in the whole world. The now. Peter tells us in chapter 1, verses 14 and 16, but as obedient children, you must be holy in every aspect of your lives, just as the one who called you is holy. It is written, and here he quotes the Old Testament, you will be holy because I am holy. As God's obedient children, never again shape your lives by the desires that you followed when you didn't know any better. Instead, shape your lives to become like the Holy One who called you. For Scripture says, you are to be holy because I am holy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be if you have ever balked at imagining that or thinking you could follow that at that overwhelming command, you're in good company. It's, it's daunting. But just because we might not know how or when or where to do that, we're not off the hook for obeying it. The Greek word for family is oikos. You might have had yogurt that sounds a lot like that. <laughs> and it's a good wholesome word. This word though in Greek encompasses three entities, three basic units of society. The first one is um, family, the second one is property, and the third one is household. And in case you don't really care about this Greek history lesson and this Greek language lesson, the word oikos is also used in our language almost every day in the words like ecology and economy or economics. That's the prefix. What does that mean for? It means that Oikos, the family, the property, the household, influences so many different things in our world. Okay, we're going to talk about that now. We are the children of the Heavenly Father, and we are expected, we are exhorted, we are commanded to act like children of God. Amen. It's not optional. This week, we have a unique and important opportunity to behave like children of God. With the upcoming election, I, I can't remember a time when it has felt so divisive and hostile and angry out there. It's in the past two weeks. But regardless of what your political affiliation is, who you're voting for, who you're leaning towards, who you can't stand. It doesn't matter any of that. As members of God's kingdom, God's oikos, our attitudes and behaviors should look like fruit. Thank you. <laughs> fruit. <laughs> Fruit of the Spirit. What are the fruit of the Spirit? It's not fruits. It's fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those nine attributes, those nine characteristics, that's what we should look like. It's not easy, is it? A few years ago, our daughter and son-in-law had to have their home retiled. And for those of you who've been there, you know what a big deal it is. It's not like getting new carpeting where it's done like, you know, one day. I've seen the commercials. But <laughs> tiling takes a while. And so they moved in with us during that time, which was fine. It was nice. It was lovely. I, I really do appreciate wholeheartedly intergenerational family living. No, I don't get that. But I would like to. Anyway. So they lived with us. It was great. But after they moved back out into their newly tiled home, they had to repaint everything because, you know, things get bunged up, right? So my daughter told the boys, she has three boys, they could paint their rooms any color they wanted. Oh, yeah, you see what's coming, right? <laughs> um, which is fine. Willem, the youngest, has a room to himself. No prop. I can't even remember what color he painted his room. But the two older ones, the teenage boys, shared a room. Not a big room, a small room. They each had a loft bed. 
So she said they could paint their walls the color, any color they wanted to. And then she asked me to take them paint shopping. <laughs> <laughs> because she's a peacekeeper, a peacemaker. She didn't want to be involved in this. So she asked me to do that, insert head banging here. And I went, okay, I guess. <laughs> if they promise to do it. <laughs> All right. So I'm sure you can imagine the inherent difficulties. Isaac, the oldest, had bright fire engine red hair, which I don't believe that influences your personality, but somehow it seems to have something to do with it. Anyway, he, <laughs> he's majoring in biology and philosophy with a, an aim toward global justice somehow. He's very analytical, very logical. Ira is an artist, and he's extremely talented. Well, you can't imagine two more opposite personalities sharing a room. Okay, I'll stop. I love my grandsons. They're <laughs> wonderful. As we got into the car, I said, okay, here are the ground rules. We will not criticize anybody else's choices. You are both wonderful. I love you to the moon and back, both of you. And if I like this color better than this color, it doesn't mean I like him better than you. Because I'm not going to tell you which ones I like. But just because you don't like somebody else's choice does not give you the authority or the privilege to criticize that choice of color. But here's the thing. You'll be looking at it forever. <laughs> right? You're sharing a room. So... Wouldn't it be a good idea if you could talk about this in a civil way and discuss it politely, kindly, right? <sighs> so we went to Ace Hardware and looked at those thousands of tiny, tiny little pieces of colors and walked around. You know, this is like pulling out, out teeth for me. It's like, uh, I don't know if that, what that's going to look like on a whole wall. Don't ask me again, okay? So I wasn't sure if we'd have any success at all. So we were looking at all these little pat patches, how, how, how the, this color might absorb the light or reflect the light. I mean, their room was kind of dark anyway. So it's like they found the colors. Unity was achieved somehow. And I bet you want to know what colors they chose, right? You would never guess. They each co chose a different shade of aqua. Oh. Who knew? I think it was a God thing. <laughs> and they were okay. As far as I know, nobody died. And they, la they lived and they survived somehow in that room. Anyway, okay, remember that Peter wrote this love letter to people who were scattered all over the world, and some of their hardships were due to the government, to the empire, the ruling powers, kind of how we're feeling today. I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat, Independent, or, or Green Party, it doesn't matter. We, can, we feel authorized to lay blame at the foot of the government for whatever. Haven't we done that? Even if we haven't said it out loud or posted it on Facebook, we, we feel like we can blame other people for the way things are going, right? So the ruling powers of Peter's day viewed the church as resident aliens to be managed, like things, like objects. They were definitely strangers in this world. So now we're going to read from the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Please rise to honor the reading of God's word. For the sake of the Lord, submit to every human institution. Do this, whether it means submitting to the emperor as supreme ruler or to governors as those sent by the emperor. They are sent to punish those doing evil and to praise those doing good. Submit to them because it's God's will that by doing good, you will silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. 
Do this because it's God's will. Do this as God's slaves and yet also as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Honor everyone. Love the family of believers. Have respectful fear of God. Honor the emperor. This is the word of God for the people of God. And all God's people said, thanks Thanks be be to God. God. You may be seated. All right, this is a powerful passage. It's there, there isn't a lot of wiggle room in it, is there? So, notice what this passage does and does not say. What it does say, submit to every human institution. Do we feel like that all the time? I don't. But I do try to follow the traffic laws. I try. Sometimes my foot gets a little heavy. I try. But if I get a ticket, I pay it. In 1994. (laughs) Submit to every level of government. By doing this, by submitting to the government, Peter says you are representing who? By submitting to the government, we are representing. I want you to understand this. It's not a government thing. It's a God thing. And by submitting to every level of government, it does not infringe upon our freedom in God's kingdom. Peter says that. Even though you are slaves, you are free in God. It's a different type of freedom, isn't it? It says, honor all people. Boom. Love those in the family, whether we want to or not. (laughs) Fear God with respect and awe. Honor the leader of the empire. Do I always agree with the president? Probably not. But I do honor the person in that position because it's the right thing to do no matter what party that person belongs to. What this passage does not say, pick and choose the laws and regulations we choose to obey. Call political opponents or other opponents names. Decide who's on our team. So how can we put all of this into practice? Remember that holiness thing? Be holy, because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Put what into practice? Those fruits of the Spirit. Oh, I said it. Fruit. One fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those nine things. All of them into practice. The fruit will only be evident. Listen carefully. This is really important. The fruit will only be evident when we are doing something. If we sit at home in our lazy boy waiting for Jesus to take us home, we're not showing anybody any fruit. We're not doing anybody any good. We're not building kingdom. We've been talking about that a lot lately, haven't we? Building kingdom. So the fruit will only be evident when we're doing something like working or shopping or studying in school or choosing paint colors. What if we, listen, what if we were known for a political conversation that displays God's fruit of the spirit instead of a spirit that divides to conquer or says, oh, look at the sign in that person's yard. What if, what if we had a positive political presence instead of causing division? What if we pursued a political vision that is rooted in loving our neighbors instead of loving our own stuff or our own opinions? It's really quiet in here. What if we pursued or cared about all of God's creation, refusing to choose between economics and the environment. So it costs a lot of money to take care of things. Why should that be a big choice for us? What about 
We refuse to choose between national security and national hospitality. What if we refuse to choose between justice and peace? What if we were motivated by the self-giving love of Christ more than self-interest, more than what's in it for me? The oikos metaphor in the first book of Peter suggests that identity needs a place to happen. Remember one of the three um, characteristics characteristics of oikos was the home, the place, it's family, it's your possessions, it's your home. Our identity is more than just who we are. It's where we live and breathe and work and play. We read about this so many places in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, we read, but so you will know that the human one has authority on the earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, get up, pick up your cot and go home. The oikos, where this man belonged. The man got up and went home. And then in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, go instead to the lost sheep, the people, the house, the oikos of Israel and so many more places. When you read the New Testament, I want you to be looking for that. How many times do you read a, a phrase or a word that could mean the oikos, the belonging of the people of God? Remember what it signifies, what it means to us. Like when those two teenage boys chose to allow for each other's paint colors. Now, they were under duress, I did tell them that if they fussed at me too much, we would go home and we would not be buying paint. So there were consequences. But they did choose to be peaceful in the process, and I was ever so happy with them. They promoted peace instead of violence in their oikos. And that promoted peace in the oikos of their family, their home. Now don't laugh at the smallness of this example. Yes, it's small. but. I'm sure that each of us has been tyrannized by some family member, right? By bad temper or bad attitudes or just pushiness or passivity, haven't we? People can be unpleasant in many different ways. We are very creative that way. So um, the prophet Zechariah tells us, in chapter 4 verse 10 we don't read Zechariah very often but maybe we should he says do not despise do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin amen peacemaking is God's business it is peacemaking is God's business and because it is God's work it is our work too what if I look at my neighbor's wall and I absolutely hate that color? Actually, this, is, this just happened. One of my neighbors painted his house, and I don't even see the color in here. It is just the most vibrant tangerine orangey red you have ever seen in your life. The entire house and his brick wall and everything. I thought, I hope that's primer. <laughs> and it's not. Um, and I thought, how can he look at that every day and not just go, ugh? But you know what? He's the nicest guy. Such a good neighbor. I could look at that and go, that's just the most hateful color, and I hate looking at it, and I don't even want to walk down that street anymore. But I have a choice, don't I? I can say, well, that's just, a, that's just my opinion. And it is. Obviously, he likes that color. So my opinion doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. It's an opinion. I can get over this. Sometimes it's easier than others, I agree. But, right? So God made each of us different. Wouldn't it be boring if we all looked the same and acted the same and talked the same and walked the same? Oh. Yeah, it'd be easier to get along, but what's the point? Right? Okay. So... Because we're different, we're different on purpose. That was God's plan. And if that's God's plan, there must be a reason for it. 
So it's our responsibility to allow God to use our differences, our diversity, to create something new. And to look at our neighbors as God loves. How does God look at our neighbors? Here's a theological question. What does God think about you? Or you? Or you? What does God think about you when he looks at you? Does he go, ew? No. God says, oh, that's good stuff. Well, guess what? God says that about your neighbor, too. And the person you just had that argument with in the line at Walmart. And the person who stole your shopping cart. And the person who... You you can tell I don't like shopping. (laughs) You know, anybody you have a disagreement with, God loves them just as much as he loves you. Isn't that hard to understand sometimes? God, how can you do that? Well, guess what? We're family. We're oikos. We need to live like it. Our identity is formed by spending time with those who teach us and shape us and by us teaching and shaping. And that happens in community. And community is looking a little different these days, isn't it? We don't have the opportunity to... I'm preaching to people who are out there somewhere, sitting on a couch, or in their kitchen with a cup of coffee, or walking while they listen to the church service. Our community is very different, and yet, we're still community. We're still oikos. We're the family of God. So while the shaping of each other is certainly the role of the church gathered in worship, it's also a household function. Remember the three parts of oikos? Family, possessions, house. Say them with me. Family, possessions, house. Those have a multitude of expressions in our lives, right? One hour a week gathered here together or online is not enough to shape our spiritual personalities, our spiritual characteristics. It's not enough. We worship the Almighty God here for this hour. And I praise God's name that we have the freedom, the ability, and the desire to do that. I am so glad to be here with all of you. But we need more. We need Monday worship. We need Tuesday worship. We need Wednesday worship and on and on and on. In this busy world of exile, how do we live as a family of God those 167 other hours of the week? We're here one. There's 167 other hours. I think we can do a better job of connecting Sunday to Monday. I want you to know that as your pastor, I understand that you have difficult lives, busy lives, that most of you are still working or in school, and you spend a lot of your work day, your weekdays, doing something else, and I'm so thankful you are here. And sometimes it seems difficult to fit something else in, but maybe we need to. Maybe that's the extra that we need. So, between Sundays, who are we? And what do we do as a people of God? We have been given the opportunity for the gift of hospitality. The word hospitality has an old tradition. It originated, you you recognize the word hospital, right? The hospitaliers were the first chaplains in the army. They were the ones who provided a safe place and prayers and took care of wounded people. And hospitality has evolved into now um, sharing, right? Sharing our homes, sharing our meals, sharing friendship. It's become more difficult for us this year. But in exile, 
our oikos needs to be reconsidered. How do we do that now? We have to be creative. A reconsidered family may be our best hope of identity formation. I'm not talking about defending marriage, the, the traditional form of marriage, or a nuclear family. Like it or not, families live in different shapes and sizes these days. I know of many adult children who have moved home to be with mom and dad. That happened to us with several of our children, and we rejoiced that we were able to do that, that it was possible. And I've told my mother, who's listening online, I hope, right now, that no, she's not going into a nursing home. She will live with me if that, if that ever needs to happen. And so hospitality, family, takes many different shapes and sizes. So the unraveling of relationships recently has made things difficult for us, hasn't it? More difficult? But humans are living that way. The hospitality of people in which people have become homeless and lost family or be unable to travel because of lost jobs during this year of isolation and economic difficulties. I mean, some of us are doing okay and some of us are really struggling right now because of our jobs, because of, you know, the virus that seems to be shaping our lives. So the hospitality of the people of God is more necessary now than perhaps it ever has been in the history of the world. The hospitality of the people of God may become a radical witness in the face of human isolation. How do we do that, beloved? Opening our homes and our, our families might make us feel uncomfortable. I know it does for many people. I, I struggle with the fact that I have four fur babies that leave lots of hair all over the floor and um, saliva marks and I, you know, I'm just being honest right now, my house is a mess. But that should not prevent me from inviting somebody into my home. Most people, some will, they won't want to come. But most people won't care if my house is a little bit messy. And I exaggerated, it's not really hideous. It just has fur balls on the floor. Because I have corgis. Look it up. But if you're too uncomfortable to offer hospitality, them do this. Pray that you can feel a holy discomfort. What does that mean? That means if we're comfortable, maybe we're not doing what God wants us to do right now. If we're too comfortable, we're not being stretched. We're not exercising our, our faith muscles, our hospitality muscles. I, I look at some people in our congregation as just the prime examples of hospitality. Bob and Cambria, oh my goodness, their home is open all the time. They have a, a revolving B&B, &B, which is partly business, mostly ministry, right? And their backyard is busy all the time. Whatever you have, God can use it, I guarantee you. God will use it if you open it up. Pray that you will have a holy discomfort in God's presence, and God will use you. Our goal is not to seek comfort for ourselves, but to be the hands and feet. I have a, a little cross hanging in my office. With it, It's not one you've ever seen anywhere else. A little cross with a Jesus hanging on it, but the Jesus has no arms or, or legs. And it was given to me by a man from Germany who said, this is the crippled Jesus. And I said, what can you explain? It can tell me about this. And he said, yes. It's because we need to do the work here on earth. Jesus left and said, you do it. We are Jesus' hands and feet. Yes, God could do it. He chooses us. I don't know why. We're not very dependable. We're not very capable. 
we're not always willing, but God chooses us. Beloved, be available. Just as the household of the New Testament letters was an extended family of kin, blood relations, slave, traveler, and other people, maybe we exiles can think family in broader terms of inclusion in this world of exclusion that says, mm, I don't think we're, you know, we're not enough alike. You know, you're voting for that, that party. You're voting for that person. You go to that church. You like that color. Let's be includers, not excluders. That might lead us in unexpected directions, but most likely, it will call the church to pay more careful attention to the formation of families in a hospitable model. Our witness in the world will be as believable as our love. Let me repeat that. Our witness, what people are seeing in the world, will be as believable as the love they see us demonstrate, the kindness the patience, the gentleness, the faithfulness, the self-control, the joy. People are dying for love. As we continue to read this pastoral letter, chapter 4 deals with passions. This past week, Dee posted a devotional on our church website. How many of you have looked at the church website in the past week? Good. More of you need to look at it. Every week, Dee is posting devotionals and opportunities for Bible study, as well as church news. She posted a devotional talking about passions. Are passions good or bad? How do we recognize them? What do we do with them? Peter talks about that. Pastor Peter talks about passions. Do you like that alliteration? He does not say we should eliminate passion, but rather that we should not be tyrannized by it. Not be dominated. We need passion. We just need our passion to be holy. So Peter's curriculum in this book, in this letter, that was sent to people all over the world. To me, it's just a miracle. It's a marvel that this book still exists, this letter still exists, because it was sent to there, and then it went to there, and then it went to there, and then it went there, and maybe then over there. Right? One letter going all over the world? How crazy is that? I mean... We have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have the internet, we have Wikipedia. No problem. What about if you had to walk 20 miles and share it with somebody and say, read this, and then you had to go somewhere else and share it with somebody else? That's how we have this letter. It's a miracle. It's a God thing. Read it. It's for you. It's for me. So his curriculum is prayer, love, hospitality, then what do we do with the hospitality, the stewardship and service? That's our curriculum as the people of God. Prayer, love, hospitality, stewardship, service. So, where are you for those 167 hours between Sundays? Living in exile gives us the perfect mindset to know how strange it feels to be the stranger in the world and the importance of living a life of holy love. So, right now, I want you, each one of you in this room, each person in this room, to think, how can I, myself, live those other 167 hours and show my witness to the world that needs to hear about love? Let us pray. Gracious Father, this is a hard thing to think about because we're opening ourselves up to something completely unknown. Or maybe some of us already know what you want from us. But God, help us to be honest with you and with ourselves and learn how to listen better to you and how to know as your oikos, how to use what you have blessed us with to bless those around us. 
all these things, God, and so much more, we pray in the holy and mighty name of our God. Amen and amen.